Hello, and thank you for joining another episode of the Ketonian Corner. This is Jolene, and I am here with my co-host, John Davidson. Hello, hello. So, we talked last time that crazy things keep getting in the way, like our jobs. Stupid careers. I know, dang. Um, And so we had to cancel our planned last week and had to move it out to this week, so... It's been a little bit since we have talked. What's been going on? No, not much. I, I've, uh, I really enjoyed our. Um, I guess our, depending on when you listen to this, our our last episode was an interview on uh, on keto carnivore, and we found somebody who was interested. I mean, who's experiencing it or doing it. So that was that was kind of cool. So I've been researching a little bit of that, but I'll save it for the Q and A. Yeah, so, I don't know, it was two, well, well, I think it was two episodes ago, you and I had talked about carnivore, and... Yeah, it was just kind of ironic. It, yeah, and so then, somebody that John knows, we interviewed on our last podcast, but in case you missed it, there was a challenge thrown out for the two of us to do carnivore for 30 days. I, I thought we, uh, I thought we... We cut that out. <laughs> no, we did not. So that was what, that was the question. Have you accepted the challenge? Not yet. We were going to wait until both of our gardens were gone. Yeah, so I thought we were going to look at maybe like the month of October. Um, well, here's the thing. Okay. So let's get right into the Q&A then because I kind of wrap these around some questions. Um. So before before we go the, before we get into the, that I do want to hit one because I thought this one was interesting and and I said I would talk about it today so I want to make sure we do it before I get off on a tangent. So uh, uh, it was uh, actually a person I used to work with and she contacted me. I guess it was yesterday or maybe the day before, and she's like, my entire family went keto. Everybody lost weight except for me. I gained two pounds. <laughs> And she's like, it's I, so you know. Uh, further on down the questioning, uh, I found out that it was really just only her first week. But the reason why I wanted to make sure I brought this up is because I feel like I've led everyone to believe that, well, you're going to lose weight really fast in the beginning. It's just water weight. So when she didn't, and she actually gained a pound or two, she was like seriously like freaking out. So, have you heard of anybody who's oh, yeah. who's gained? It, it's not typical because most of us are pretty damaged from eating all these years of garbage. Um, she's but, she's very active. She's a group fitness instructor like I am, and uh, you know, board, I wouldn't say borderline cardio intensive, but you know, she's still run. I don't know if she's running right now, but I mean, she's run. Yeah, right. so okay. physically, I'm going to guess, not knowing who this person is, but physically, I'm going to guess she didn't have a lot to, of weight to lose to begin with. Um, the other things that people really forget is that this is not a weight loss program. This is a better health way of life. And so there are so many things that come into play with that. First of all, hormones are a huge thing that we've talked about. Um, and again, not knowing anything about her, anything about her history, I'm going to guess that she probably doesn't have hormonal imbalance. Um, she actually may have needed to gain a couple of pounds. People forget that when you go and change your lifestyle to this, your body is always, regardless of what you're eating, your body is always trying to come to homeostasis. If you are a little underweight, keto will make you gain weight. I mean, that just is the reality of it because your body really wants to stay in that good balance. Now, eating a standard American diet, it's constantly fighting and generally not coming to it. But when you eliminate all of those outside factors and you're eating good, clean, whole foods, your body has that ability to do that. So while most people do get in this to do a weight loss, that really isn't always the result. And sadly, that may be her reality. Maybe she actually should be gaining. And again, I mean, I, I don't know who this person is, but I'm just speculating. So we, do you feel like we maybe, if you've been listening to us for a while, I 
feel like we've been we we kind of say oh you might lose a lot of weight right at the beginning but don't expect that do you think we've maybe sent some false expectations because we keep because I think I think from our direction I think we've talked about that before in Q and A's because we don't want to set the expectation that it is weight loss you know what I mean yeah so I probably okay so we probably have set an unrealistic or an, I don't want to say unrealistic, but well, unfair or whatever. Yeah. Just what, maybe like when whole, we say calories don't matter, but right. we kind of do, but yeah, right. see what you're saying. So as a whole, I think how we have been talking and the direction that we have been talking to is actually accurate. There are always those outliers. And the one thing that for me, I always try to do is I am the, the typical, right? I had the extra, extra weight, I've got the hormonal issues, I had all of that stuff, so keto is working on me like it does your typical person, but I always try to point out that you are different. You are, you, you do have that athletic physique, you are active, you do all of these things, so your response is going to be different than mine. And so I try to always, I mean, I don't think that we really um, elaborate a lot on that because I I think you're abnormal. <laughs> well, well, no, like and I that. don't mean that bad. But I, well, I've got no facts and data because I kind of slid into keto sideways. Yeah. And through primal, so I don't. I have no clue about losing weight, gaining weight. I think overall my body composition has changed, but I don't have any facts and data over how fast and any of that stuff. Yeah, and again, I'm going to assume that your friend was not eating your standard American diet. She probably wasn't eating. She's probably for lunch right. And, you know what I mean? What if so, somebody who has followed the yo-yo diet? So let's take. So we talk generally. So you know, you're talking about how you might be the standard person, but I think there is another quote unquote high high likelihood that they fall into a category where they have done the almost calorie restriction diet and then fell off the wagon and ate maybe crappy and then they did like some other fancy diet of the day and then you know came back so we'll call that the yo-yo diet stuff where they maybe have damaged their metabolism yeah it's like because like i think maybe in your example uh, when you said people are all different, if somebody is a yo-yo dieter, what do you have any experience or thoughts on what they would expect based, based on a different person? Yeah, so again, there is a huge possibility that a yo-yo dieter could gain weight in the beginning. Because their the body why, is like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, the reason why is because they do do calorie restriction. When you go to keto, the calorie restriction isn't, it, it isn't the focal point. And you have to remember that when you bring in high fat, fat is nine calories per gram of fat, where protein and carbohydrates are four calories per, per gram. So if you have been on a low fat, and I mean, let's face it, every diet is going to tell you low fat and calorie restriction, regardless of what protocol you're following outside of keto. But if those are the two things that you did, and now all of a sudden you're on keto and you're eating high fat and you've reduced the carbohydrates, you automatically already are consuming more calories in the same quantity of food because you've shifted it up. So is there a possibility that you could gain weight? Yes. It doesn't happen with most of us because we also have those other factors. But again, if your friend is... Um, you know, super athletic and already thin and good muscle to fat ratio, then it is a possibility that they would gain weight just because they have changed the calories from being a calorie restriction over. Now, that doesn't mean that it will last because generally it's short-lived once your body understands that they now don't have to store every single thing that you're putting in there because you're no longer calorie restricting. It'll get used to that, and it'll it'll start allowing you to release some of that weight again. But it is possible. Um, again, we don't talk a lot about it because it's not typical, right? Those are generally outliers. Well, we've very. I mean, I guess I took this sideways from my friend to more generally to the yo-yo dieter. But I do think that there's probably a quite a bit of people who fall into that um, where they've restricted calories enough that they're metabolism might be 
damage to where that when they switched, well, they would start. True, but if you think about your typical dieter, they're still way overweight, right? So I think I think in your example, what we're what we would be looking at is a yo-yo dieter who is somewhat fit and doesn't have those other. Somebody like me who's been a yo-yo dieter who does have all of the other things, the hormones and all of that stuff into play, they're going to probably react more like I would react versus somebody who is on the leaner side who doesn't have the other. So right. it is a possibility, I guess, bottom line. <laughs> it's short-lived, but yeah. How short-lived do you think? I would say no more than two weeks. Um, as long as you stay consistent with how you're eating and your body truly does kind of get used to the fact that you're feeding it and that you're not trying to put it in starvation, um, it will start releasing that excess weight. Okay. Well, good. I, I wasn't adding a lot to that conversation, so uh, I, uh, it's nice to have somebody to bounce that off of because I think sometimes we only remember what we went through, or in my case, I don't even remember, so <laughs> there's definitely that. Um, I, uh, it isn't a question, but feedback that I thought was interesting. At one point, we had had a Q&A where we were talking about fasting, and somebody asked us what the hardest part of fasting was, and my response was the social piece to um, sitting, you know, not sitting down at the table with my family and stuff. So anyway, this is more of a tip than a Q&A, but they said, hey, if you're looking for something social, just make soup, but instead of soup, just make it salt water. And the fact that you warm it up and you eat it at the table with everybody else, that it is lets you have the social aspect with, and you're actually physically doing something. I thought that was kind of an interesting yeah. tip, because it, it just drive me nuts to not sit down at the table. Yeah, see, and your, your life is a little different than right, that. You've so got kids and, kids and um, so. to do that. I mean, my husband and I sit at the island, and there's plenty of times, and we a lot of times we don't eat at the same time. Either one of us is not hungry or, not. you know. So for me, it's a little bit different, um, and besides the fact I don't fast, so. Well, you tried I did try, and I'm super scared to do it again. I know that I should, like logically I know, uh, um, but the experience that I had, I haven't yet let, it hasn't been enough time for me to have forgotten how it made me feel, so. <laughs> yeah. I will probably attempt it one more time, and if it makes me feel that way, again, I would likely never do it a third time, but. Well, salt was the, the game changer for me. That's why I thought that salt soup was a kind of an interesting Yeah. He really pretty much just could take water, put it in a bowl, microwave it, and then throw it and then salt it. And right, yeah. Just sit there and eat with everybody else. Yeah, that's a great tip. All right. So we didn't get very many questions, by the way. Just throwing it out there. So if you want to hit us up on the socials or the emails, um, we're always looking for, for questions. So your question to me, which I punted, <laughs> was the whole keto carnivore. And I guess my question I still struggle with is the whole how in the world do you just eat meat and still keep those ratios to where you have that much fat? Now, you think I, I mentioned that a couple of times in the interview, and I still had a mind block on it. So I did, did do some kind of digging on that. And... You just can't have chicken breasts. <laughs> you can't. You can't have. I mean, you can't I, have I lean think, protein. I think what you mentioned was. I mean, so there's a couple steaks that are lean that you would just. I guess I would just either have to supplement with something or or do do something like uh, you know go to more of like prime rib and stuff like that that has a higher fat content. I mean, you know. More more meats that are marbled. Yep. So I guess I kind of got I get around that mental block, but I still could not kick the whole vegetables. You know, we talked about it, and I was just it's been bred into my mind, and I think that right there is enough to make me say I should do this because I have that stigma, stigma or whatever the word is around it because I've 
you know, it's funny, you know, like look at yourself in the mirror, you know, you're basically saying, you know, switch out carbs for plants, you know, you're, you're repeating yourself, right? And I guess that's kind of a little bit of the gauntlet you threw. So one thing I did and I, that uh, is I looked for a book. Okay. And uh, the one I picked was The Plant Paradox. And The Plant Paradox is a, is a book that is talking about the quote-unquote healthy foods. And I think they're, you know, within the first few chapters, I mean, they're, they're just kind of say, you know, hey, if you listen to the news, these superfoods, or maybe aren't as super as you think. Um, kale, goji berries, quinoa, you know, chia seeds, like all these things that, you know, we've been marketed to as healthy. And uh, the other thing I was listening to is the some of the podcasts revolving around, um, if you kind of look at the same, uh, I guess, uh, direction, uh, a lot of the things to talk about, you know, plants can't defend themselves, for the, so their self-defense is creating these pseudo-poisons, at least for us, yep. as, and uh, oxalates, and your body producing these oxalates. And uh, so, I don't know, do you, do you know anything about the whole oxalate thing? I Because I, I really don't, and I listened to a couple of, you know, our, our, looked at a couple of articles and the plant paradox didn't really touch on the oxalate thing, but it does make a little bit of sense. And to be fair, the oxalate isn't exactly, it's, it's that's what happens chemically when it's in your body. Um, but I guess I just want to flat out say, I don't really know a lot about oxalates at all. So it might be something, a topic for another time. Yeah, I, if you don't know what they are. So part of um, what you were talking about was the uh, the plants not being out, not having yeah. any sort of way to defend yeah. themselves, and so their defense is against any predator, right? Is um, the poison that they have them in or whatever. So there are a couple of people that, if you're interested in doing some more research, um, Georgia Eads has some pretty good information out there on that exact topic. Um, Amber O'Hearn is very knowledgeable in the different pieces um, as for carnivore overall. She has actually eaten carnivore for nine years. Um, and so she's, she is full of knowledge. Before we get back to the Plant Paradox book, since we're heading this direction, is she is she the one that, that that talked about the vitamin C as an example? We, we saw her at KetoCon. Right, and we yep. talked about it. yeah. Okay, yep. And it's like it's been what's that called? It's been dripping on me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Peter Ballas Ballas Ballastat, I think that's how you say his name. Um, for those who believe that eating animal products is damaging the oh. environment. Um, if you are interested because of that, um, then he is a great resource for that. The guy is beyond smart. Um, but he really puts it into terms that you can relate to and makes absolute sense. And I have to be honest, I didn't have a strong opinion one way or the other prior to talking to him, but most definitely have a pretty strong one after talking to him um, and listening to some of his podcasts that he's been on. So definitely worth investigating uh, his story and what he has to, to tell about that. So, Okay. I've, you know, one of those things where I've never had that problem. I've never really thought that we were killing the environment. I mean, I do think factory farming is bad. Yeah. yeah, which and he does as well. I mean, there are um, there are definite things that he does agree with, but in general, um, cows going to the bathroom not depleting the ozone is basically like the gas. Yeah. So. All right. Well, to kind of maybe summarize a little bit more from the plant paradox because we got a little time. 
uh, a lot of the book was rehash of some of the primal blueprint principles we've already talked about. The avoiding grains, avoiding some of the legumes, uh, plant protein versus animal protein and the differences uh, and the ratios, um, you know, how lectins, you know, weren't as bad previously and, you know, because we've changed plants, you know, it's not the same as it was, you know, for our ancestors. A lot, a lot of that. A lot of the chapters were revolving around that. Um, and then they went to a whole section on the, you know, we think whole grain is good and that whole grain adds adds to the, you know, the amount. So, like, for instance, if you have a gluten intolerance or any type of sensitivity, the fact that you have whole grains makes it even worse. So, you know, the, the, that, that piece of the paradox. Um, the things that I thought were maybe a little, I guess, weren't, uh, I guess, talked about any other place, so maybe that I, I would call them to be unique to this book, is uh, they talked about um, a cleanse, which for me automatically I think, oh, that's dumb, you know, cleanses are stupid, because that's kind of like my mindset, but I'm trying to keep an open mind because I'm looking at some of this stuff. And their cleanse was interesting. It actually wasn't really a cleanse as much as it was a way to almost ramp down. Uh, so let's say, for example, you have a lot of uh, vegetables in your diet now. They're, they're cleansed. And here, I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit of snippet. So it's basically a green smoothie. Uh, it's made from romaine lettuce, mint, some spinach, avocado, uh, and then, or and that particular type of smoothie is very. I mean, those plants, believe it or, you know, are, I guess, the least likely to contain any of these toxins and stuff. So it's basically a way to kind of let you down. But ultimately, the whole entire synopsis of the plant paradox from a recommendations standpoint is they come down to say, I'm going to go ahead and read this too so I'm not so I'm not like a, you know, summarizing it in my own words. Uh, recommend uh, up to eight ounces of pastured chicken, wild caught fish, sides of vegetables that are sticking around cauliflower, cabbage, and broccoli. So um, and then it talks about, you know, those were I'm not drinking a whole bunch of this, you know, other stuff. If you want to put on oil, an avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, something like that. And then, you know, try to have straight up coffee or green black tea. And, of course, somewhere in there, it's uh, don't forget to, to do your eight cups a day. So it's really when it comes right down to it, uh, you know, they talk... It's uh, the whole thing revolving around limiting the non-nutrient-dense vegetables. And then they have like this really short list of some of the vegetables that are, that are quote-unquote not as bad. So all that said, it definitely... Um, uh, definitely threw out some things to think about. Oh, one, one, uh, one of the things that was in there too that I thought was interesting is how um, a lot of the fast food restaurants, the stuff that they add to their meat, so a lot of us feel like, oh, well, you know, um, you know, we can be keto carnivore if we go to McDonald's and get our burger with, you know, just the patties. And i got to be honest, I've eaten a lot of McDonald's McDoubles without the bun, just the meat and the cheese in my life. It, they talk about a lot of the additives there. So a lot of that stuff is, uh, what's it called when you would rather just not know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so to summarize, some plants, and I'm going to read a section again. Some plants contain proteins like lectins, which to us end up being poisons for predators. That's how they defend themselves. So eating these plants, we end up inadvertently poisoning ourselves. 
So if we want to, we could follow the outlined six-week plant paradox program to eliminate all of these trace trace amounts of, uh, of contaminants. So ultimately, I'm not going to probably follow their diet because I don't think I'm that far off. I think maybe if I had, if you were uh, you know, coming to it from a standard American diet or something, maybe maybe you would find benefit in that. But I think I probably stay away from a lot of these things in just in general. Yeah, I think my just I mean I have never read the book, but I think from just talking to you about it, I think my takeaway from it is it it raises enough question that maybe you probably should investigate um, a little further in how just how healthy is vegetables really for human beings because I mean if you if you look at it and I know that they say you can feed your dog certain vegetables and there are certain things you shouldn't but I have a garden that is not contained and I can tell you my dogs don't touch it they don't sniff it they don't go near it they could care less about anything that's in my garden which kind of has to tell you that if it was something that they wanted to eat because my male he'll eat anything if, if there is food, he will eat it regardless if he just ate his, his meal. So you kind of have to look at nature, and the questions really become a lot more pronounced if you but kind of question. Like, what about, like, bunnies and well, sure. like, all, like deer and all these things? I mean, they would... Because they have would. different stomachs than we do. Yeah, but doesn't a dog have a different stomach than we do? No. The intestinal system of a dog is similar to a human. However, a deer is a ruminant. And it, the reason, what, a, what that actually is and how cows, deers, goats, I forget what the whole thing is. they digest it differently? They have a two-chamber stomach. It, they, and this is disgusting, but they eat it, they chew it up, it goes into their stomach, and then they regurgitate it. They chew it again, and it goes into a second chamber of their stomach because they have specific bacteria that have. They, I mean, without those that process, they could not consume and use that either. Um, dogs do not have that same sort of setup. A rabbit, I'm not sure if that's a ruminant, to be quite honest. Um, I just know a rabbit would just. Um, yeah, rabbits. But rabbits are. Um, I mean, they're they're herbivores, so. Their system, their digestive system must be different. But if you look at a carnivore animal, you've got lions and tigers and bears, oh my, no. <laughs> um, but dogs, right, they're carnivores. But if you watch them, seriously, carrots, I mean, if I hand my dog a carrot, they'll chew it like it is a chew toy, chew toy but they don't eat it like it's a piece of food, right? Um, it, it, once, you, once you get this question in your mind of whether it really is healthy, if you really start paying attention to nature, it kind of starts hitting home a little bit more. Well, it's definitely opened my eyes a little bit. Uh, I think I already mentioned I enjoy my garden a little bit. So right now I still eat some tomatoes, those type of things. Um, and uh, once it dies, uh, what, when, what did you say? I was thinking October. I think our stuff should be gone. I mean, you may you have a larger garden than I do. I don't I don't have that much, so as it's producing, we're eating it. Right. Whereas we actually like green beans and stuff. Yeah. Tomato sauce and whatnot. Yeah. So I'm gonna throw out something that you've never heard about maybe and maybe you have. So okay. have you ever heard of the M E C diet? It's a Japanese diet. I had not ever heard of that. We, we talked about this, didn't you? You mentioned it. And then I said, well, said, we're not talking about it. We're not talking about <laughs> it in this podcast. Okay. Well, yeah, I so I actually it. didn't find a ton on it on the Internet except for those, you know, like the articles where they just give it a short review. But the, well, what's, what does it stand for? MEC stands for meat, eggs, and cheese. And a lot of the books on it are written in Japanese. So it was a Japanese doctor, I think, that uh, maybe call it as a, as a niche or something. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, basically, the, I mean, the only thing different is the fact that there's a maybe, I don't know if I'd say arguments, but some people are, we talked about it on the carnivore one, 
whether or not you eat cheese is kind of up in the air. Some people are, aren't crazy about cheese and some people don't care, but the eggs is technically not a meat, but it comes from maybe the, you know, it's a, you know obviously it comes from the chicken. So. so do you consider meat, egg, and cheese for this experiment? Would you consider all those three? I probably would. Um, so... Because I, I could see me... I could see me being much more successful at that than only eating meat. Yeah. I think I'll struggle. Um, I've mentioned before that sometimes I just crave big salads and stuff. Which I find to be so weird. I know you do. (laughs) I do. But I think if I had a little more variety, but if I just, it probably sounds worse than, than reality, but I just picture myself eating like meat every day just I just can't get that yeah so I think it's fine and and quite honestly I've listened to a lot to Amber um I I'm gonna throw this out here but I would like to get her on this podcast and interview her um but I've listened to quite a few uh interviews with her and like I said we've seen her at KetoCon um I think she started out that way uh, and quite honestly, most of the people that I know of that are carnivore have started out allowing the cheese and all of that. Um, and through doing that, once they got used to it, I think then they continued their research and they have started to eliminate. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, it's, you know, if it's, it still is a meat source. You're still not getting the... And I don't even want to say carbohydrates because that does have carbs, but you're not getting the fiber and the the uh, impact from a vegetable by eating those things. Yeah, maybe I should go back and find some podcasts that she's been on to listen to. Cause I'm- Actually, I think the last one I just listened to was um, Robert interviewed her. Oh, really? Yeah, Robert Sykes, anybody who doesn't know that, Keto Savage. Oh. Um, yeah, right. that was the latest one. And it was like she was, she went very in depth explaining the different things. Um, so, it, so I probably have it in my queue and just didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Yeah, so, which I'll link that in our, in our show notes too. But, uh, yeah, she definitely is one to listen to. Um, but again, the Georgia Eads. I think for you, John, that would be somebody that you should either try to, because she does have some interviews um, out on YouTube, where not that she has done, but she's been on other people. Right. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, she also wrote a book. Her and her husband are both doctors, um, and I think that I think she wrote a book as well. And she, but she goes into pretty good depth on the whole. There is no defense mechanism, and their defense is that they poison you, which as a human, we the poison isn't strong enough to kill us, but it is definitely strong enough to not make our health optimal. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, like, I, I got to be, I mean, it's, I just so you can picture this in your head, it is rare that I don't put, like, flecks of spinach... <laughs> in even hamburger meat. I mean, like when I make meat lovers chili, I mean, cause any leftover kale or spinach or anything that's about to go bad, I, I put I put it in the freezer and I just smash it down and pull the stems out. And I will literally shake it in like it's a seasoning. That's funny. I mean, that's like, I've just, I don't know, I've just always and done why? that. And is, why? Is it because you think that that is a yeah. healthy thing to do? Well, for sure. Incorporating sure. it in every meal. For sure. Yeah, which, to be honest, is why I eat vegetables. You only um, eat vegetables because you feel like they should be. Yeah. And I only eat those that I think, like spinach, for instance. Although I actually do like this taste of spinach, even as a little kid. And this is going to gross you out because you, you're a fresh vegetable kind of person. But I would, my mom would open up a can of spinach, and I would just eat the spinach right out of the can. That is gross. As a little bit To me. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, so spinach is one thing that I actually do enjoy the flavor of, and I prefer canned spinach over 
fresh oh. leaf spinach. I know that's weird. It's like a, a family, you know, people have family dishes. Mm-hmm. There's a spinach casserole that goes around at family events, and it's I actually do eat it still because it's one of the one things at family events that because it's just spinach and cream and like ricotta cheeses and stuff. I mean, and some egg, and eggs, and it's all and it looks completely disgusting. <laughs> it's, Sounds good I though. Love it. Um, but yeah, in general, like my whole life, I have eaten vegetables because I thought that that was going to make me healthier. Um, not because I've enjoyed them, to be honest. See, I, I like vegetables. Until probably, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, I never would eat strawberries. Okay. I would never eat watermelon. And of course, I don't so, eat that anymore. Um, but even tomatoes, I was probably well into my 20s before I would eat tomatoes. See, like, I would, I would be cutting the grass, and especially when we just started with the um, asparagus, when the asparagus would just come up, so there's only like two or three stalks, I will stop cutting the grass, get off, and break those things off and eat them while I'm cutting the grass. Raw, straight up raw. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. There's no way I would eat Oh. Like right now, just thinking about it, if I would, I would totally. And asparagus is another one. I, it was probably five or six years ago. Um, Grilled asparagus. Since, since my husband and I have been married, and we've been married eight years, so within the last eight years is the first time I've eaten. For the record, I will not eat store-bought asparagus raw. I, oh. The only time I eat, eat it is when it's, I literally break it and just put it right in my mouth. Like I don't, I mean, it's at the house. It, it does taste differently. Okay. Then the stuff you get. Yeah, like, I mean, see, with, within the last eight years, I would never have eaten asparagus before that, ever. And, and again, not that I ate super healthy. I mean, I didn't eat keto before. I loved meat. I've always loved beef, um, but tried to stay away from it because I thought it was unhealthy. So, I mean, you know, when you do that, you don't eat vegetables and you don't eat meat. You kind of have nowhere to go but in the middle and eat junk because, you know, you have to eat something, so you're going to eat a bunch of processed. And that's what I did my whole life because I tried to do the healthy thing, but I don't like vegetables, so I didn't want to do that. 30 days, though? Man, we really turned this Q&A to be about us, didn't we? Well, (laughs) it's really about us. (laughs) Well, to be fair, Fair. I mean, when we started this podcast, there was not a ton of resources, and now a lot of the Q and A stuff that was was some of our most popular stuff. I mean, there's doctors. Right. Like Barry's getting those questions. So why would you listen to our opinions when right. you submit your questions to him? So. Which leads us into a great segue. We do not have time to talk about this. Well, <laughs> we can we can give a little teaser. Our format is probably going to be changing. Yeah. So there you go. Stay tuned to next time. And yeah, and hope so. Hopefully, you like this. Us almost, I wouldn't say catching up with each other, but it's a little more raw. But I think that's a value add to people who are maybe thinking the same questions and stuff. But it is becoming clearer and clearer that we don't. Our, the niche is not there anymore through download numbers and everything else. Uh, it's, and it's just we spend a lot of time prepping and stuff that there's a ton of research, resources out there. Yep. So I don't know what we'll do yet, but just keep in mind we have, something might change. So. And if you have ideas of what you would like to hear, please let us know. Especially if it's differentiating. Um, you know, it's, if it's more of the same stuff, I mean... I don't know, we, we tried Facebook Live, and just, it's, it's not our niche. <laughs> well, we suck at all social medias. So. <laughs> okay, it's all right. So tune in, and we'll uh, figure out what we're doing. How's that? All right. Thanks, guys, for joining. Don't forget, we are out on all the socials, and I do answer questions and, and try to stay on top of that. But we're at Ketonian Corner everywhere you look. We're at ketoniancorner.com or ketoniancorner Gmail. So shoot us some ideas, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.